I'm really excited today to be uh, chairing this panel on, you know, delivering innovation of gene therapy to patients through strategic collaborations. Um, you know, we're relatively, so I'm Debbie Drain, I head up global commercial development at CSL Bering, and we're relatively newcomers uh, to the gene therapy world compared to many uh, at this meeting. I think I've realised we're one of the biggest unknown companies uh, in the world, probably, um, because I've had to explain many, many times uh, who CSL Bering is uh, this week, but that's okay. Uh, really pleased today to have our panellists join us and thank you everybody for, for joining me here today. Uh, we have Lawrence Cow, who's Head of Commercial Strategy at Spark Therapeutics. Um, we have Joss Lehman, who's Head of uh, Business Development uh, at Unicure. And we have Adam Simpson, who's Head of Gene Therapies BD uh, at, at Novartis. So I think we have a great panel of people who, who've had a lot of experience uh, doing strategic partnerships. So it's great to uh, have them here today. Uh, the format that we're going to use today, I'll just quickly introduce this unknown company called CSL Bearing. Um, and then I'll ask each of the, the panellists to come up and introduce uh, themselves in a little more detail and talk about their companies from the perspective of, of strategic uh, collaborations. And then we're going to have a bit of a panel session, so we've got, got some uh, Q&As that we're going to do. And, and of course, we'll invite the audience also uh, to um, give any questions that they may have. So with that, uh, let's go on the slides. Oh, here we go. We're up there. So, so yeah, I'd just like to spend just a few minutes uh, introducing CSL Bearing. So if I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. Disclaimer, we can uh, go to the next slide quickly, thank you. So at CSL, we're really driven um, by our values and, and this is a slide that we always show at, at pretty much any event that, that we do. Um, and, and it's because we feel like our values bring us all together and they, they unite us uh, in what we uh, are all about. And the one that I want to focus on today, of course, is collaboration. So collaboration uh, is really key to us. Um, you know, we're predominantly a plasma company which makes us very different from most biotechs uh, and pharma companies. And that's because plasma is an extraordinarily expensive uh, raw material. Uh, so generally, our margins are very, very tight. Uh, and so we don't, we, we really have to be careful and thoughtful uh, about the way we invest. And, and to sort of ensure that we can be successful going forward, collaborations and partnerships are key to us. Next slide, thank you. Oh, I've got the wrong slide deck here. We can skip over. How about we just um, put the slides down? I apologise, I'm not sure um, what's happened here. Well, maybe flick through a few more and I'll see if we get to the actual deck that I thought I had. Keep going, keep going. Yeah, no, no, you can... Well, you can stop there for a minute. So CSL... Uh, is an Australian company. You can probably tell from my accent um, that I'm not, not native to, to the US. I actually work out of our Philadelphia office, but, but I'm, I'm from Australia. We're an Australian company, and we're made up of two uh, entities, CSL Bearing, which is the biggest part of our company, and then Securus, which is our flu vaccine part of the company. Uh, if you jump to the next slide, and then I think we're going to skip all the rest of them. This one's a little outdated. Being an Australian company, our financial year runs from 1 July to June 30, so we just closed our, our financial year and announced our results not long ago. This is from last year, but a little bit about us. We, we have entities and affiliates in over 35 countries. Um, last year, our, we, we, our, our revenue was $10 billion. Uh, we, we invest a lot, and that number's gone up to $4.1 billion uh, in R&D. We have a lot of people, um, which is why I say we're one of the biggest unknown uh, companies. And what we mainly do is uh, collect plasma. But we also, we have three platforms in the company. Plasma, which is obviously our biggest, recombinant technology, and then our newest addition is uh, cell and gene. And not in these slides, but, but 
Partnerships there have been key to us. And we originally, in 2017, came into the gene therapy space via the acquisition of a small company called Calamune. And they, they were really focused on ex vivo technologies, prim primarily in sickle cell disease. So that's kind of what got us into the space. We have our manufacturing facility for cell and gene therapy uh, just up the road in uh, Pasadena. It's a rather unique facility in what looks like a strip mall to me. Um, but we've been building that out um, over the last three or four years. And we, we're very excited still with, with that technology. Then in um, 2020, we, we obviously, and, 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 Josh and Josh and I got to meet as part of that, albeit virtually at the time, we announced the, that we took a global commercial licence to Unicure's Haemophilia B product. And we're really excited about that. Uh, it's in late stage development. We're getting ready together, mainly Unicure at the moment, driving the submissions. And we're really excited to be able to bring that therapy to haemophilia B patients. Um, and we also, sorry, that, that, that took a while to get through FTC, so it really cleared um, uh, about gee, almost a year ago now. And we also were really excited last year, we announced a big collaboration with Seattle Children's Centre. You know, I mentioned we're a plasma company, our biggest product is immunoglobulin. Uh, and our biggest indication is primary and or secondary immune deficiency. And so the collaboration with Seattle Children's uh, Centre is really all around using gene therapy for primary immune deficiency, and we're really excited about that as well. So with that, again, apologies for the slides. Um, being I, I somehow sent the full CSL uh, slide deck rather than the one that I modified for this meeting. Um, but I'm, I'm going to ask Lawrence to come up first and talk a little bit about his company. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, Debbie, and thanks for ARM for, uh, for having me here. Um, I'm Lawrence Cow. I'm the Global Commercial Strategy Lead for Spark Therapeutics. Um, and uh, I've been with, with Spark through, through the commercialization of Luxterna, our, our gene therapy, and uh, pre-launch, during launch, and, and post-launch. And uh, before I begin, just, uh, just a few uh, highlights of, uh, of my company here. A quick refresher. I think this is the... Uh, Button right, green. Here we go. All right. So, uh, Spark is a leader in gene therapy. Um, we uh, we have some therapeutic area focuses, such as uh, the ocular space, inherited retinal diseases, um, in particular uh, hemophilia, lysosomal storage disorders, and uh, CNS. Um, we had the first gene therapy that uh, that was approved. Oops, somehow that back with the first gene therapy that was approved for a genetic disease in the U.S. and um, four assets in the clinic, uh, six in uh, preclinical programs, and we're based in Philly, um, which is quickly becoming a hub for, for cell and gene therapy, as you know. Um, within the organization now, we've got more than 500 employees. Um, that number probably needs to be updated. The, the number of employees is growing day after day. So uh, it's, it's more than 500 employees now, but again, the number keeps on rising. And um, last but not least, we are now a member of the, uh, the Roche Group. So. And over the years, Spark has really been striving to realize the potential of, uh, of gene therapy, the full potential of gene therapy. And one of our, um, our visions that we've embarked upon has been to create a world where no life is limited by genetic disease. And um, I mention this because in going through the lab partnership um, case scenario that I'm going to, to go through today, um, it really goes back to this vision of creating a world where no life is limited by genetic disease. And so in going through this uh, case, I'll take you back to um, more than five years ago, pre-partnership, um, Spark was still uh, a, a very small company. We were not a member of Roche yet. Um, and uh, at the time, prior to the launch of Luxterna, um, Spark was still endeavoring to have the first and only gene therapy for a genetic disease approved in the U.S. And in going into the ocular space, um, we, we realized at the time that a clinical diagnosis was not going to be enough 
uh, for, for patients, for, for healthcare providers, and also for, um, for payers as well. So that was true for payers as well. A clinical diagnosis was really not going to be sufficient in the space. And so we realized that um, raising awareness of genetic testing was going to be paramount, was going to be crucial to the success of diagnosis and treatment of, of IRD patients. Um, a further hurdle that we had at the time was that um, genetic testing was still not a part of the mainstream diagnostic standard of care that uh, was in the ocular space at the time. So that was something that we were faced with back then. Um, and so Spark entered into a partnership with a, uh, with a genetics lab uh, in order to process um, genetics lab panels for IRD patients. And this was going to be at no cost for um, healthcare providers, no cost to patients, and no cost to payers. And in doing so, uh, the program called ID Your IRD was born. Um, Spark created the concept for the program. Um, Spark created the branding. Um, the program was designed to raise awareness around the, uh, the IRD community of the importance of genetic testing um, in the community. And Spark also included in the program um, a lot of the details on websites, specific websites that included um, patient stories, insights into genetic testing, and also um, you know, ways to get genetically tested. And um, that became instrumental. All of those aspects became instrumental in the commercialization um, process and setting the stage pre-launch, during launch, and post-launch. Um, and so as, as the first gene therapy became available in the US, um, and it, as it became a reality, the, the ocular community was better able to understand the importance of a genetic diagnosis um, as part of the management of, of IRD patients. And, um, and so that's how sort of the partnership evolved. I'm going to come back to this slide real quick um, and go to this slide. Um, so fast forward, post-partnership now. Um, the Spark ID Your IRD program now contains approximately 300 genes associated with IRDs, which are included in, um, uh, many of which are included in the, uh, or being researched um, for therapies in development. So many of these genes you probably um, have heard of during this meeting or will be hearing of during this meeting. Uh, but 300 genes associated with IRDs, including um, many of those which um, you're, you're hearing about in the news as well. And I won't get into, obviously, every single one of those. But, um, you know, going back a slide, fast forward again, post-partnership, um, one of the benefits, of course, was creating awareness among the ocular community that we, that we strive to be in. Um, but an additional benefit of, of the increase in testing was also that it allowed for insights into the prevalence and into the epidemiology of, of genetic variations and mutations within um, many of these 300 genes, many of which um, we had been collecting data from uh, since, uh, since 2016. So um, that allowed for a, a greater view into the unmet medical needs of the IRD com community, and it continues to um, provide valuable insights and, and, a, and a, a view into some of the epidemiology of some of these lesser known genes. So um, post-partnership here. So where are we today? Um, Spark sponsored panels have significantly outpaced the existing offerings for IRD patients in the US by making it the most used of any IRD panel in the nation. Um, Spark, as mentioned, now has access to a large repository of data, uh, which, can, which can be helpful for other internal programs and external programs and, um, and patients seeking therapies in development. Um, Spark, now, Spark now partners with four different genetics labs. Um, you know, not all labs are, are the same, and uh, a lot of the time um, it's helpful to, 
to uh, gain clarity to a patient's diagnosis, and different labs can, can have different classifications for, uh, for different types of variants and so forth. Um, Spark also has a genetic diagnostic field team. So um, this is a field team that's dedicated to driving testing as their primary responsibility. And um, again, uh, you know, the Spark's ID your IRD uh, program contains approximately 300 genes associated with IRDs. And um, you know, we're, we're getting more genes on that panel every single day. So bringing it back to the vision of, of Spark, which was to create a world where no life is limited by genetic disease. This is really just one of the ways that Spark has really been trying to um, achieve that objective um, prior to launch, during launch, and, and, and post-launch here. So thanks a lot, and uh, happy to answer any questions uh, post-session here. Thanks. Thank you all. Um, thanks to Debbie and Arm for having Munich here again for this panel discussion. Uh, for looking statements, please see unicure.com for any SEC filings and company disclosures. <clears throat> so yesterday we had a, a corporate presentation where we went over the company, where we stand today, and some of the strategy going forward. I'll touch on that a, a little bit today. But the point of this talk is to really discuss how the partnership with CSL came, to, partnership with CSL came about how it looks, and um, what we'll do moving forward. So uh, Unicure is very proud of, you know, the history of the company and, you know, the products and the process. So, you know, it was stated yesterday uh, that the process is the product. So manufacturing is key to us. So when we think about the company and looking back, uh, you know, we were the first to receive regulatory approval for gene therapy. I don't know why this says in the Western world, but uh, it, in the world, I don't know if, the East, the Far East had a gene therapy before this, but perhaps. Um, we were the first to, with our HD program, we were the first to use a gene silencing approach uh, as a gene therapy, and we entered that into the clinic. Um, with our AV5 platform being used for the hemophilia B product, we, uh, Unicure was the first to show positive clinical data in patients with pre-existing neutralizing antibodies. On the manufacturing front, we have 15 year experience uh, with commercialization of a CGMP scale uh, process. Um, you know, we have strong IP over this process and both the, the product and the platform aspects. And then we continue to invest in, you know, what we're, what we're gonna look like going further with novel capsids, uh, promoters, and other enabling technologies. And, you know, we have some of the best people in the field. Uh, but, you know, I think that our, the story we were most happy about is what we've done in hemophilia B. So back in 2008, uh, Unicure was still a very small company. This was, you know, even before being listed on the stock exchanges. We had licensed a uh, wild type factor nine cassette from St. Jude's. And by 2015, we had named that AMT061 and entered it into a phase one, two study. Uh, but by 2017, it was clear that we had not achieved the factor nine levels we had been looking for and many thought the program was dead. Uh, again, because of our faith in our, in our platform, which was AV5, we did not give up, and we made a small change. We exchanged wild-type factor nine for the Padua variant, and we were able to convince that the regulators that this was a very minimal change, and they allowed us to move forward. So by 2018, we had entered into a phase one, two, uh, 2B dose confirmation study, and soon thereafter, the phase three uh, HOPE-B trial. And so in two and a half years, we sort of started that pivotal trial and uh, had some data. So last year, we completed treating 54 patients. This year, we announced follow-up at all 54. And uh, things, you know, we're very proud of how that looks. And, um, you know, I'll talk in a minute here, and I think CSL is also. We identified CSL as the partner of choice for how to bring this to patients in the fastest, most efficient way possible. So before we get to that, uh, you know, there's more to Unicure than just the, the gene, uh, heme B program. And that sort of motivated us as to where we went moving forward. But just briefly, uh, there at the top, you can see we have the, the lead clinical candidate um, in hemophilia B, now with CSL. At the bottom, we have some very early stage research collaboration uh, programs with BMS. But internally, we have programs 
in liver directed diseases and as well as uh, you know disease of the CNS where our next uh, fast uh, furthest along program in HD resides. <coughs> So the strategy of the company has always been to aggressively advance and expand the pipeline and to invest and strengthen the platform. So, you know, last year, and we sort of saw it coming before that, we were in a tough position, right? So we're a small company, we have limited resources, and we had to get this wonderful drug, AMT-061, to patients, and that was going to cost a lot of money at the expense of a lot that we saw in that pipeline. So we sort of endeavored on a partnering process, and it became very clear that to us, I mean, CSL was no stranger to us, although Debbie wants, to be, wants us to believe that they were somehow unseen by the world, but in hemophilia, they're very, very well known. Um, and so it, be, it became very clear, like, this is the way to go. You know, they have the expertise, they can, you know, expedite this to the patients, and uh, we can be great partners. So as we looked more at CSL, you know, they're, they're well-established, specialized in a, in a highly... Hemophilia, for the, those of you who don't know, is highly competitive. And a lot of these companies have been in it for decades. Um, they know the patients. They know the physicians. Um, and so for a small company, or any company for that matter, to get into that market is, is quite a task. Um, they've been a leader in this field for over 30 years. I think I stated yesterday that they had a commercial footprint in 80-plus countries. Um, and so the relationship over these 30 years with, like I said, patients, treaters, communities is just second to none. Um, she, uh, Debbie, presented updated uh, financials, but they had a billion dollars in hemophilia sales in 2019 and um, commercial sales in, I guess, now over 100 countries. So to us, it was a no-brainer, partner of choice, and uh, so we did a deal. Um, and it was a historic one, especially for us, but I think for the field, it validated the field. It validated gene therapy. Um, it was one of the largest announced to date, especially for a product. Um, so <clears throat> at the end of the day, CSL is going to be the ideal partner to bring in Tronadez to the largest number of patients in a global sense. Um, it positions us to aggressively pursue all of the rest of the pipeline, most notably AMT-130 in, in Huntington's disease. Uh, and so $720 million pro forma cash uh, provides a runway, you know, several years into the future, which we can use to expand our pipeline, develop that pipeline, and, uh, you know, innovate on our platform manufacturing capabilities. Uh, so a little bit more, uh, again, we don't want to talk about money all day, but $450 million up front and uh, $1.6 billion in commercial and regulatory milestones. We have double-digit royalties, um, and they will thankfully reimburse us on some of the things we do. So, uh, you know, hopefully this all works out and the patients are served. It, it's going to enable Unicure. And just briefly, uh, you know, I, uh, slide four or five, I talked about how we are always looking to expand the pipeline and enable, further enable the platform. So here on the pipeline side, one of the major goals is to advance Huntington disease. Um, so we just dosed our first patients in the second dose cohort uh, for our phase one, two trial. Um, we plan to have some very, very early safety and biomarker data from the first four patients treated later this year. Um, and then we're continually looking for, you know, next generation approaches, less invasive administration. Um, we are accelerating internal R&D. Um, so as I stated, we're looking at both liver directed and CNS disorders. Um, we, AB5 is our workhorse. You know, we have a large safety database around that. We've, we've had eight, clinical, eight different clinical trials and over 100 patients treated. And so we like to look for more indications where we can use that. And uh, we're also investing in these next generation therapies with, you know, more targeted, more potent uh, approaches. And then we're always, always looking to bring new products in. So we're especially focused on IND, near IND clinical programs, as well as, you know, great ideas, new targets, uh, which is exhibited by our, our most recent deal with Coraleaf. They're a French company uh, working on temporal lobe epilepsy. And then from the platform side, um, we're constantly building out our organization. We've expanded capacity in our Lexington site to have a, a process to sort of um, go alongside our CGMP process that will, you know, that will support the new research we're bringing into Lexington next year. And of course, we have a 500 liter CGMP process being built out in Amsterdam uh, that'll come on board in 2022. Um, 
And then we're always looking for new tools. Again, next generation components. Uh, we want to make sure we get a handle on redosing. That allows us to dose titrate and get at these pediatric po uh, populations. Um, and then we're always looking at new technologies, whether it be gene editing or some other RNA type of modality, uh, genetic nucleic acid modalities. Um, and like I said, you know, help scaling up beyond this 500 liter and capacities in, in Lexington and Amsterdam, we're looking to bring this from a 500 liter to 2,000, 10,000 liter process. This is gonna help us reduce COGS and get at diseases with, you know, that are more common and, and more patient need. And I think that's it. Yeah, that's it, so thank you. Hello. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much for the uh, for the invitation to speak here today. I must say, um, this has been my first meeting back uh, in person post pandemic, and it's been truly invigorating. I think to to meet up with so many uh, you know old <coughs> colleagues um, in the space and see all the great advancements that were made even during the pandemic, um, which is super impressive. So. I'm Adam Simpson. Um, I head up uh, Gene Therapies BDNL at NIBR, uh, which is the early research and development engine of Novartis. And if we go to the first slide, I'd like to just kind of uh, make two uh, statements um, about Novartis um, to kind of get us started. The first is that Novartis has a truly global presence. So we have products currently being sold in over 150 countries uh, around the globe. And I think the, the really impressive figure is the one below that, which is that these products touched uh, the, the hands of 800, approximately 800 million patients in 2020. And this is across, across our eight core uh, areas of drug development. You can kind of see those key disease areas of interest there on the slide. Um, and then importantly, you know, we remain kind of uh, agnostic uh, to platform. Um, so we're currently pursuing six platforms of drug development, small molecules, antibodies and other protein therapeutics, uh, siRNA, uh, radio ligands, and then importantly for uh, this topic today, uh, gene and cell therapies. And then the second thing I'd like to indicate about Novartis um, is that it is a heavy, uh, has a heavy, heavy interest um, and expertise in research and development. Um, so approximately $9 billion um, dollars were invested in R&D in 2020. Um, uh, with over 16,000 R&D associates around the globe. And importantly, we had over 25 major regulatory submissions in the major territories in 2020 alone. And that was from over 500 ongoing clinical trials. And I think the single most important stat on this slide is that you know, much of this would not be possible without external partnerships. So we have over 400 industry and academic uh, alliances to date. And the goal uh, really is to aim this research and development engine at building out uh, you know, a really robust portfolio of various modalities and technologies across all of the platforms I discussed and across the uh, disease areas of interest to us. So if you take a look at the sort of the gene therapy aspect of what we're uh, working on, you know, we have an interest in pursuing known and novel delivery modalities. Um, as well as canonical gene therapy approaches, that is to say gene replacement and knockdown approaches, uh, as well as pursuing novel payloads where it makes sense um, across uh, kind of the core uh, disease areas of development for us. And in particular, you know, we have expertise at the moment um, in neuroscience and ophthalmology. I'll talk about a few examples of some strategic deals we've done in, in those spaces uh, in a few slides. Um, but I also want to mention that we have uh, a burgeoning interest um, in expanding gene therapy in our other core areas of development, and, and we'll certainly update on those efforts in a future meeting. So if we just kind of take a step back um, as to how Novartis sort of made its fruitful foray into gene therapy in the first place, um, this really happened back in 2018, and I actually pulled this uh, kind of snapshot slide from the 2018 Novartis full year results presentation where at the time, uh, the company had decided to undergo a strategic shift away from certain of its core businesses um, at the time and refocus those efforts and those resources into innovative medicines. And in particular, um, gene therapy, cell therapy, and radioligand therapies, and to do so by way of you know, highly strategic, um, transformative transactions in those spaces. Um, which would serve to really entrench and cement us um, in these areas. 
And in particular in gene therapy, um, you know, our foray into the space was really driven by, you know, two key deals that we did. Uh, first, uh, an XUS commercialization license to Lexterna from Spark. And then importantly, um, a major strategic acquisition of Avexis, which I believe many folks in the room uh, probably know of. Um, but with that, uh, with that acquisition, um, you know, we uh, retained the rights to the lead product, which was a late clinical stage asset at the time. That product is now known as Zolgensma uh, for spinal muscular atrophy, uh, as well as a preclinical portfolio of uh, additional CNS and neuromuscular um, uh, assets. And then importantly, we, uh, we got uh, the rights to the platform. Um, so this was a, kind of our foray into the AAV um, uh, platform itself. And so, you know, um, with these kind of highly strategic um, transactions in the 2018 timeframe, we really immediately, uh, as I said, cemented ourselves um, and entrenched ourselves in the gene therapy space and with the goal of becoming, you know, uh, the world's leading expert in the, uh, in the space. And so since the acquisition, I just wanted to indicate that the team has done a very good job on the Novartis end of bringing Zolgensma, which is our core product, um, to as many patients as possible. Um, I believe many folks, uh, perhaps all in the room, know of, of this product, but just very briefly for those who don't, uh, Zolgensma is an AAV9 one-time gene therapy uh, for spinal muscular atrophy, um, which is a highly devastating uh, rare pediatric disease. Um, and uh, since the acquisition to date, we have uh, gained approval of this program uh, in uh, 41 countries to date, um, and it has, uh, has been in 1,400 patients to date. And that's ac across clinical trials, managed access programs, and, uh, and uh, now in the marketplace. And this asset really shows truly transformative benefit for these patients in terms of enhancing or pro prolonging survival uh, and improving uh, major motor milestones that have never before been seen um, in the natural course of, of this disease. And so I wanted to include uh, now this slide, um, which is um, short, sort of uh, highlights a couple of key points about, um, about Novartis and how we go about doing deals. Um, you know, these, uh, these programs that you see here, these companies, um, you know, are, uh, you know, uh, agnostic across uh, disease area as well as modality. And I just wanted to indicate a sort of a sampling of the deals that Novartis has done uh, across, uh, you know, over the last two years or so, um, just to indicate um, a couple of key points. First is that Novartis is a fairly acquisitive company. Um, you know, we're very interested in executing strategic external partnerships. Um, the second key point is that um, we are uh, very interested and have a lot of appetite to engage in these external partnerships um, in the most creative uh, ways necessary to really bring these therapies forward as quickly as possible to patients. And so, you know, we contemplate acquisitions, uh, licensing transactions, R&D collaborations all the time um, in industry uh, as well as in, as in academia. Um, and the other thing to indicate on this slide is that of these kind of key deals that we've done over just the last couple of years, you can see that a number of these, uh, in, which are, uh, have blue stars here, are in uh, the gene therapy space as well. And so we are highly committed to the space and then bolting on additional innovative platforms and therapeutic approaches uh, into really continuing to build out the engine by way of external innovation. And so in the remaining time, I'd like to just provide uh, a few vignettes of uh, recent deals we have done uh, in the gene therapy space to give you all kind of a flavor of the types of, of, uh, of external uh, partnerships we contemplate. Uh, again, always with an eye toward bringing these drugs forward as quickly as possible for patients. So the first one here is a, is a deal we did with Sangamo Therapeutics uh, last year. Um, and this was a, a really interesting and creative deal we did with them. It was an, uh, a research and development collaboration um, which utilized uh, their zinc finger protein transcription factors. Um, these guys are the leading, uh, world's leading experts in this technology with a, a couple of decades of expertise here um, to access these uh, uh, zinc finger proteins um, for three targets in the neuroscience space uh, and then marry that technology with our AAV uh, platform technology. So this is really a combustible research and development collaboration where both parties brought together um, their innovations, uh, again, with an idea of bringing therapies forward for patients uh, in major, major medical need. 
Um, and so, and the other thing I would point out is that, you know, um, we pursued this deal with Sangamo uh, for these key targets, um, which we could not have otherwise pursued with a canonical, uh, you know, gene replacement or knockdown approach. Um, and so we're very interested in pursuing, you know, call it gene therapy 2.0 and 3.0 approaches uh, where the science is warranted to bring therapies forward for patients. And then the second set of deals I'll talk about are in the um, ophthalmology space. So as many know, Novartis has a, um, a, lot, a lot of expertise uh, in treating diseases of the eye. And in particular, you know, we think that uh, gene therapy represents a modality that could provide truly transformative benefit um, for patients suffering uh, from blindness indications. Um, so this first deal was an acquisition we did last year of a biotech company called Videra. Um, and with this acquisition, uh, we uh, got access to two preclinical um, AAV optogenetic assets, as well as uh, uh, underlying technology for enhanced delivery of these, um, of these uh, uh, modalities um, for inherited retinal dystrophies and geographic uh, atrophy. And these are a couple of indications that um, have you know, 2 million and 5 million patients worldwide, respectively, so this is really, um, you know, planting a stake in the ground um, and going uh, sort of big and bold into trying to take this modality uh, into um, broader patient populations and get it into as many patients as possible. And then even more recently, we also acquired a biotech company called Arctos Medical. Um, this is also an optogenetics company, but it's a distinct and complementary approach to the Videra acquisition. Um, and with this acquisition, we uh, gained the rights to another preclinical optogenetics uh, asset and its underlying technology um, with the idea here of taking this into a blindness patient population uh, that's driven from photoreceptor uh, uh, loss and, 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 and being able to treat the patients um, in a way that is not dependent or contingent upon their underlying um, disease mutations. Um, and the last thing I'll say, which I don't have a slide on because we haven't, uh, uh, you know, really been public with um, a number of these deals, but, you know, we're very interested in uh, NIBR and Novartis in going in early um, where the science is warranted. Um, and so we have done a number of deals over the last couple of years since formally entering the space uh, within academia. You know, we really think that a tremendous amount of innovation in this space is, is, um, is going on. Uh, within our academic institutions, and there are a number of really uh, great uh, technologies that we think we could complement and help expedite the development of uh, coming out of these uh, laboratories. And so I guess the last thing I would leave uh, um, you all with is that Novartis has a heavy focus on uh, external innovation and partnering. Um, and, uh, you know, we really believe that no single institution can you know, in earnest pursue every single innovative idea on their own uh, from start to finish. And so we really look to form fruitful partnerships in creative ways with the external world um, to bring these therapies forward as quickly as possible. And as you can see, you know, by 2024, we anticipate that half of our revenue stream will actually come from these types of partnerships. So it's really core to our business and our, and our business model. So I think with that, I will um, stop and uh, turn it back to Debbie. So thank, thanks, Lawrence, Josh, uh, and Adam for that great introduction to y y you know your companies with a with a focus uh, on collaboration and and I think as you see from that you, you know collaboration is really key to the success of many many um, companies, big big and small. So we're going to now go into the panel side of the of the uh, workshop and. First off, we're going to kick off. I'm going to ask each of each of the panelists to talk a little bit about what the key benefits have been for those partnerships, focusing on commercialisation. So, you, you know, um, particularly Adam talked a lot about early stage, and I, I think partnerships across the entire development. Um, span are, are really, really important. But for this question, we're going to ask them to focus a, a little bit on commercialisation and do it from the perspective of the innovator. You know, what's the benefit? You, you, you know, most of most of these guys came from the the innovator side, you know, whether it was Avexis into Novartis or Spark into Roche. But what's the benefit from a commercialisation perspective? So maybe... Um, 
And then maybe additionally to that, what are some of the learnings and, and maybe pitfalls, if there have been any, um, that you've had during implementation of some of these, um, particularly the big deals looking at uh, commercialisation? So, Lawrence, why don't you kick off? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, and, and to answer this question, I, th I think I'll use the example that uh, Adam brought up here of, of, of the Spark and, and Novartis collaboration. And, um, you know, I'll take you back to prior to when Spark was a member of Roche. This was way back. We had just launched Luxterna. We were still a very, very small biotech company. And, um, you know, we, we were faced with the uh, making difficult decisions of answering the question of how do we get our gene therapy to patients as quickly and as seamlessly as, as possible. And um, so we, we know we wanted to reach every single patient. And in doing so, um, we needed a, a global partner. Um, we needed to collaborate with a global partner that, um, that had longstanding relationships in, in local markets and ties in local markets. And um, if, if we were not to do so, then we would run the high risk of, of leaving patients out or um, patients potentially not getting access. And um, so, so fast forward to, uh, to today, um, Luxterna has, has thrived through the uh, Spark and Novartis collaboration. Um, it's getting approved and reimbursed in countries, uh, more countries day after day. I think the last count that I had heard was um, worldwide, including the EU, it's, it's approved in 42 countries um, and, and reimbursed in more countries um, day after day. And, um, so, um, you know, so really, um, you know, collaborating on a global level was, was really, you know, the fundamental to help achieve that objective. And, and of course, this, um, you know, this concept of partnering with a, uh, a larger company is, is applicable both to um, Spark prior to um, being a member of Roche, being a small company and, and collaborating with Novartis, as well as currently as uh, Spark is a member of the Roche Group. Um, and, and being able to leverage the global capabilities of Roche um, to commercialize its assets, uh, XUS. So, yeah. Um, so the second question, I guess, um, some of the some of the learnings and the and the pitfalls. Um, you know, I, I think um, three key learnings. Um, number one, it, it really takes a team, and and it takes a, a true partnership. Um, you know, um, in, in gaining approval, um, there, there were many times when, when Novartis had to come to Spark for a whole host of information and resources. Um, you know, things like um, um, having local authorities inspect Spark facilities or um, Spark directly answering um, CMC questions for the local authorities. Um, but uh, Novartis has really leveraged Spark as a, uh, as a extended team member. Um, and so really having, um, you know, that, that team mentality. But number two, also there's going to be um, bumps along the road. And gene therapy is, is hard. It's, it's extremely difficult. And um, there's going to be situations that uh, put stress on that partnership. And, um, you know, uh, those situations can range from everything from manufacturing to regulatory, pharmacovigilance, um, time frames shifting back and forth. Um, and so you want to have the foundations of that strong partnership before these, these stressors occur. And so um, that's, that's learning number two. And, and learning number three, I think, is more of a pitfall to just kind of watch out for in, in the partnership. Um, I think, um, you know, in, in such a specialized disease space, um, when you lose personnel, you're, you're also losing um, key knowledge, key relationships, key ties. And so that's something that should just be on the radar to really uh, plan for those and, and identify those risks prior to and, um, you know, perhaps have some plans to, to mitigate those risks such as, um, you know, secession planning or, or um, you know, alternative arrangements, um, you know, outside or so forth. So, yeah. 
Great, Thank, thanks, Lawrence. And, and I, I, I should say, um, Josh, if we were at a haemophilia con conference, I wouldn't have said we were unknown. So I just didn't want you uh, <laughs> to get nervous that you didn't put your wonderful product in the hands of a very capable company uh, in haemophilia. Um, we're very proud of our 30 or 40 year heritage there, so, so don't want you to get nervous. So, so perhaps, Josh, you can talk a little bit, you know, it, about our partnership and some of the, the benefits and learnings you've had from the sure. Unicure perspective. So we certainly aren't nervous, so good. don't worry there. Good. Uh, <clears throat> so I've been on both sides of this. I'll speak to it from where I am now at Unicure. Um, you brought up, you, you prompted us by saying, speak to it as the innovator. And yep. I think that's a really interesting way to think about it because whenever you're on these deals, whether and wherever you are in life, I sort of think, and the company thinks as well, that we have to be aware of who we are, what we're good at, and who we're not, right? So Unicure is pretty darn good at coming up with gene therapies, identifying targets, you know, manufacturing. So those are things we're good at. And um, you know, through our experience, uh, we actually did develop some regulatory experience and some clinical development experience. So we could get so far, right? We, we had investments in the infrastructure and we had experience in, that, in those parts of drug development. Where we didn't have any experience in any infrastructure is how to take uh, you know, a drug from the clinic and get it to patients. And so, like I said in the talk, you know, we had to figure out were we going to make that an investment or could we find someone who's really excellent at that? And so it was a confluence of things that came down to it. Was, it's not a, an orphan disease where maybe you can target a couple specific treatment centers or physicians or, or whatnot. It, it was really, it's a massive disease, right? And it's global. It's spread across treatment centers throughout countries. And uh, there's many, many patient organizations. It's complex, competitive, and it was an easy decision for us to make. So we found an excellent commercializer, right? And a, an excellent partner in hemophilia. And so that was an easy call for us. Um, and now we've been able to take in those financial resources that we've gotten and reinvest in what we're excellent at, right? As an innovator in gene therapy. And so hopefully we can keep on churning out great products and help patients and other diseases. Now there's other companies, you know, like I said, I had a life before this where I was more on your side. And we'd, have, we'd identify companies that hadn't invested in regulatory and clinical. And so there's many companies that look for a partner at that stage. Um, so I think in general, to answer the question, I think from my experience, it's just being aware of who you are, what you're good at, and, of, and identifying partners that complement you. Um, in terms of pitfalls and benefits, I won't say any, I won't we haven't any gone pitfalls. We have any, right? Yeah, there's, we, that's we've perfect. Got no problems. Everything's great. Um, but I will. I invite you to share your experience as well. But um, whether it be a you know a professional relationship or a personal relationship, uh, communication is absolutely critical. And I think we've done a pretty good job of this. I remember in 2020 when I was waking up in the middle of the night or late in the afternoon to have these conversations with Australia, and we'd have our colleagues in Europe who were, you know, doing the same thing. Um, so it was a willingness to succeed together and to do what it takes and to communicate and. As Lawrence pointed out, there's going to be there going to be times when you know things are rocky, right? Uh, the regulators are new to gene therapy. We're hearing new you know strategic inputs from them day to day. Manufacturing any biologic is tricky, um, and then you know data is always tricky. So there's there's an acceptance of good communication and a willingness that we're in this a realization that we're in this together, and that there's no you know, sort of, because they're the bigger, com CSL is the bigger company that they sort of are running us. They've given us a lot of rope. They've, they've allowed us to do a lot on our own. You know, they realize that we do have this regulatory experience and that we can, you know, put together these filings. But they're there to help if need be. And so I think it's just, I, I, it's just like you would think a real personal relationship is like, you know, communication and a willingness to help, but not control. I think, I don't know if you have a different take, but. Yeah, no, no, and, and, I, I completely agree. Communication uh, is is key. You know, we we had the um, uh, unfortunate <coughs> burden of having a very long FTC clearance process. You know, being big in haemophilia brings that burden on you when when you're doing a big deal like this, which meant we couldn't communicate to the level that we would have liked 
during that, that time frame. So, you know, the day we got FTC clearance, it was like, thank goodness, we, we can now talk and we can now communicate. And, and yeah, the benefit of, the, of that is, is really key. Yeah, and, and poor Josh, our head of BD resides in Australia, so they're not used to the time zones. We're pretty, we're pretty used to them, but um, it's tough when you've, uh, you've got that, that kind of challenge uh, as well. But no, I, I think it's gone really well. I think I wouldn't underestimate the value of having really strong alliance teams. You know, right. you, you actually have a strong alliance yeah. team and we have a strong alliance team. And, and their job is really to, you know, sort out the problems on either side. So I, I think that's a really important, you know, to have someone that their job is to go back into the respective company and, and get the right people to the table to, to, to have those discussions. Um, so Adam, Adam, from your perspective. Yeah, sure. So um, I guess I uh, would need to put myself in the innovator's shoes yes. in the circumstance. <laughs> Um, but I guess the key, uh, you know, kind of third case example we could talk about would be Avexis and the mm -hmm. Avexis acquisition. And, you know, if I were looking at it from their perspective at the time, even though I was a part of Avexis, but post-acquisition, um, you know, uh, just to uh, sort of reiterate Lawrence's points, um, the key thing is really looking at it from an innovator's perspective is how best to get our baby to as many patients as possible, right? And I think partnership with um, you know, a larger institution that has that global presence is uh, and, and a proven track record of being able to launch drugs globally um, in as many markets as possible is critical, particularly for, you know, something like spinal muscular atrophy, which there's prevalence, uh, prevalence of these patients in uh, many, many of the territories around the globe. Um, and so looking at it from their perspective, it was time, you know, it was time to hand off the baton. Um, uh, they had, you know, highly transformative data um, to, you know, in, in these patients, and it was time to move rapidly forward to approval and try to get the drug launched and into patients as quickly as possible um, and globally, um, because these patients can't wait, right? Um, and so I, if I, I imagine if I were in their shoes, looking at it from their perspective, that's what they were probably thinking. Um, and then in terms of pitfalls, I guess a slightly different um, scenario as well, given that this was an acquisition one of the key questions that typically comes up is, okay, well, how do you deal with that? You know, do you integrate um, immediately into, you know, the larger organization? Do you hold them as a separate entity? Um, what's the uh, what's the game plan? Um, and I think, from my perspective, I don't view an integration or not as a binary event. Um, I think it's really important to sit down and take a look at, um, okay, what is the stage of the asset? What's the next set of um, objectives to to contemplate with um, with the asset or the platform, and what is the status of the team around it, and how nuanced is the field that we're in? Um, and you know, it, it made sense in the case of Vexus that, you know, post acquisition, it made sense to hold them as kind of a, a semi autonomous entity um, because of the expertise and specialized expertise that they had built up in gene in gene therapy, um, and the fact that the team had all been cohesive and working together, and they were coming along now um, as part of the next step by and large. Um, and then, uh, you know, more recently, it's no secret that certain aspects of the business have been integrated up into kind of sister components of the broader Novartis um, organization. And that also makes a lot of sense because with time, you know, these collaborations grow within these various functional areas and it simply makes more sense from a resourcing perspective for um, there to be a seamless transition um, of certain aspects of, of the business. So. You know, I really don't view that aspect uh, following an acquisition as a binary event. Sometimes it makes sense to do, to do it that way, uh, keep totally separate forever or, or bring immediately in, but a lot of times it's more nuanced than that. Yeah, no, I, 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 I agree. I think back to our acquisition of Calamune and everyone saying, leave them, leave them on their own, leave them on their own. The problem with that is you don't get the benefit of, of the, the kind of value that the bigger partner yeah. uh, can bring as easily, I think, it, and yeah. We'll touch on that with Lawrence, uh, Lawrence shortly. So, actually, that's that's probably a really good segue into that, Lawrence. Can you you talk a bit about Spark today in the Roche organisation? So everyone knows Spark is still Spark, but but you're in this much bigger organisation. Can you talk about how that works? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so Spark is still in the in the integration phase. 
um, but there's, there's collaboration across the spectrum. And uh, I can say that uh, you know, Spark, as you said, remains an independent subsidiary of Roche and an integrated gene therapy organization. So by um, integrated gene therapy organization, I mean you know, Spark's manufacturing, Spark's regulatory, Spark's development, Spark's medical and commercial um, are all still supporting Spark's gene therapies. And, um, you know, and, and Spark now being a member of Roche, a, as mentioned prior, um, gives Spark now the, the working ability um, to leverage those global capabilities um, to help Spark commercialize um, Spark's assets, um, XUS. But, um, you know, we're, we're still in the, in the integration phase and, and um, there's, there's collaboration across all of the, all of the spectrum and all of these aspects. So. Yeah, it's really interesting. I'm sure many of you, you know, sat in on the, the Bluebird uh, presentation this week, and I think, you know, that the challenges that they've had in Europe really highlight that this is not easy. Getting reimbursement, XUS in particular, uh, is, is tough. And, and, you know, I think that's probably one of the areas that experience really does. Experience and infrastructure, I would say, uh, really is is critical because you, you know I know as we're preparing, you, you know for a Trinidad's, we it's a lot of work getting getting every country ready uh, for for something as novel as a gene therapy where where the the reimbursement pathways are actually not very clear, <laughs> so so it's it's already going to be tough even for for a big company. So maybe Josh, can you talk a little bit about? So your strategy has been quite different to, to Spark. You know, yours has been more a licensing strategy, but you still own the platform, right? So you've got partnership with us, obviously, uh, in haemophilia. You've got a partnership with uh, earlier partnership with with BMS, but you own the platform. So can you can you talk a bit about about that and why that was really important for Unicure? You touched a little on it in your yeah. presentation, but maybe you could elaborate uh, on that as well. Yeah. So. I uh, gene therapy is unique in that there is still a bit of magic that goes on with, with making these products. Uh, Jeff McKay yesterday said the process is the product. We've said that all the time. Um, ultimately, uh, uh, to just to be completely transparent, a fair bit of all of our company's values are based upon you know this platform and our ability to modularly, quickly get products through the, the research and development uh, process in a, in a timely form manner and to actually get it through commercialization. You know, one of the things that I always observed, I've always observed in gene therapy is that, you know, there's a lot of companies and there's a lot of academics out there who can only go so far, right? They can come up with a great target, they can show proof of concept with non-GMP uh, materials. And then when you sit down to actually manufacture it for a clinical stage or commercialization, it's not necessarily as simple as you might see in small molecules where you, you know, scale it up. Um, so we have a lot of value. We place a lot of value in it. I think the street, other folks put a lot of value on our platform. And <clears throat> this was, you know, I think when you look back 23 years ago when, when the company was started and, and even when we started uh, investing in manufacturing, really no one else was doing it. You know, it's, it's a sunk cost in many in, in reality and not much value is placed on sunk costs until you can show you know, that there's value to it and that you can manufacture better than someone else could do elsewhere. So we've always, we're very aware of this. And so when we have these partnerships, uh, we have to treat them all differently. So with y'all, with CSL, you own the product. And so you own the process for that product. And so everything is wide open. But it hasn't always been that way. You remember last year when when are you going to open the kimono? When are you going to show us, right? And we would push back, and we didn't do it. We never do it until we are absolutely certain that this is the partner of choice and that we're going to move forward. We can't take that risk, ultimately. In partnerships like with BMS, where we're essentially, it's a research partnership, we're essentially making product for them. Um, it's their targets, it's their programs, so we're making product. We are a lot more closed off. Um, we sort of ensure an end product to enable them. Um, and so in this case, you know, a deal is made one day, we might be making the product six, seven, eight years later, things change. So we have to be open and willing to sort of bend and, and maybe take, realize that we have to innovate new things to get the product they need and 
be more communicative. And then there's the core leave, uh, the core leave deal. So that's a little bit different. So we acquired them, but in doing so, we also acquired the deals that they may have signed elsewhere. So they may have deals for capsids that they signed with someone else, and we need to make sure that we don't accidentally look in and borrow ideas, right? We don't want to contaminate ourselves. So that's a new, that's a new experience for us. And so that is, we don't want to contaminate our platform, so we have to fence post in the right ways. And we have to make sure that people are, um, you know, quarantined away from certain other people and other pieces of information. And so that's an ongoing learning for us because we've never necessarily been on that side of it. Um, but yeah, I think just having awareness of the IP we have, the, the tools that we have, and um, you know, that we need to protect them in many cases is sort of how we operate. Great, thank you. So Adam, you touched a little bit on you know, how Avexes kind of have evolved to what's now called Novartis Gene Therapies, but can you talk a little bit about that evolution you know, and, and what the focus is today? You touched a bit on that, but yeah, if you could yeah. elaborate a little more. Yeah, happy to. So, um, so again, just kind of zooming back out to uh, the acquisition itself. I mean, you know, we could think about that as, again, our foray into Gene Therapy 1.0, right? Um, it was a transformative asset. It was a platform um, as well that we then uh, quite candidly invested a tremendous amount of resource into to continue to build out in preparation for, um, you know, it continuously innovating additional gene therapies. We're in this for the long haul now. Um, but, you know, Avexis was really a 1.0 approach, traditional, um, naturally occurring serotype that goes very well to that particular site of action um, with a gene replacement approach. Um, and then, uh, again, some earlier preclinical assets as well that kind of follow in the same vein. Um, phase two of our approach uh, over the last couple of years has been to bolt on additional technologies that we think we might need for future research and development purposes to ultimately bring this modality to the masses. Um, and so I highlighted a few of those deals, but you know, they contemplate super cool <laughs> scientific approaches and things that you need, frankly. Um, and yes, earlier stage, riskier arguably, um, some of them approaches, um, but those are bets that we feel we need to make in order to try to bring transformative benefit um, to broader patient populations uh, who otherwise wouldn't be able to benefit. And so the transformation has gone you know, somewhat from, and we, and by the way, we still have quite a bit of effort and expertise in the 1.0 type of approach, um, but we feel that we need to complement that approach with this next generation of, of medicines and this modality. And so that's where the effort has been from a BD and L perspective is on trying to identify the most promising science and bring it on and bolt it into the existing gene therapy um, um, platform. And so that's kind of phase two is, is bringing in the tools we need. Um, and then, you know, phase three now going forward is to try to expand into all these different disease areas um, using these innovative tools um, to, uh, to begin engineering and bringing medicines forward in these areas. Um, so that's where I anticipate we will go going forward. You know, again, our core areas of expertise are in CNS and I, but I mentioned that there are plenty of other areas we're starting to explore, um, explore as well, so. Great, thank you. So Lawrence, you talked, you touched a bit on your strategic laboratory collaboration and how mm -hmm. important that was for Luxterma. Um, so you know, as as you know, you know, and I, I think you're very proud and should be as the first FDA approved gene therapy. Can you talk to us about how this that particular collaboration, so the collaboration with your lab partners, mm -hmm. was key for you? Yeah, um, you know, and, and and some of the learnings from that, I think were that, uh, you know, in going through that, we, we had a lot of kind of insights that we gathered because, you know, we, we, we wanted to listen to our, our customers at the time. And so really one of the insights was, was being as flexible as you can and working with your lab partner to, to um, you know, listen to the customer and maybe adjust your offering. Um, so in, in our instance, um, you know, at, at one point we had a, a single gene test and, and that wasn't something that the customer necessarily would, would be utilizing um, as much. And so we were able to, to, to do a lab partnership with, um, with a lab to, to expand that panel to, um, 
to a much wider panel, and ultimately today it's, it's around 300 genes and, and um, you know, thriving. And so really just being flexible to, with, with your lab partners to, um, uh, you know, to listen to the customer and, and, and offer what they need. I think um, number two would be um, to really work through um, any ambiguity with, with your lab partners. Um, you know, in, in the world of genetic testing, it's not always as simple as, as a positive or, or a negative. Um, there's, there's a lot of gray area where, um, where, where results can be uncertain. And um, every lab is, is completely different. Um, you know, some labs differ in, in what they classify, for example, a variant as, as pathogenic or likely pathogenic or unknown. Um, so, so hence the reason why Spark um, partners with, with four different labs to try and, and get the patient a, a definitive diagnosis. Um, and, and there's a symbiotic relationship between, between a lab partner and a manufacturer um, in that uh, you know, both entities are, are really trying to create awareness around genetic testing, but also um, both entities are really trying to, to get that, that patient or that family a, a definitive <coughs> diagnosis to, um, to, their, to their disease. Um, and uh, I think the third learning uh, that I'll mention is, is really just to, to leverage the, the data and the results as, as much as possible because there are there are many reasons, um, aside from just being a positive for a treatment or whatnot, there are many reasons why a patient and their family um, would benefit from, from having a, a genetic diagnosis. Um, you know, having, having them know the particular mutation that they have um, will potentially change or, or make a difference in the way that they think about their disease. And, you know, for example, um, you know, if a patient has more information about their mutation, they can plan for the future a little bit better. Um, if they know specifically um, what their causative gene is, um, patients and their families can, um, can also look into clinical trials, um, opportunities for clinical trials and advancing research. Um, you know, if they know what their genetic diagnosis is, that can help them unlock um, you know, educational and social services that are available. Um, and in addition, if they know what their causative gene is, they can be able to connect with other families and, and other patients that have the same or similar um, disease. And last but not least, um, I think one of the benefits of, of um, you know, uh, having a, a patient might find a value in having a genetic diagnosis because um, they'll have more clarity or they'll, they'll be able to be more sure about the inheritance pattern of their disease as well. So all of those are, are, are reasons why, uh, aside from being a positive for just the treatment or whatnot, that um, manufacturers and lab partners can help patients realize and, and leverage the full value of, of having this, um, this data. So, Great, thank yeah. you. So Josh, can you, um, can you share a few thoughts on how, the process, a bit about the process that you go through, you know, to choose, say, a wonderful partner like CSL Bearing. Um, but, but what's the process that, that a company like Unicure need to go through to identify the right partner? Sure. Uh, well, one of them comes in, you know, I, this, I think the first question you asked me is clarity in what we are good at and clarity of what we're not good at. Um, and clarity where we want to be. So... There are different deals we do, right? So let's start with maybe like BMS or Coralief. So we value greatly uh, something that we've really worked on over the last couple of years that I've been part of that I came into the company and worked hard on this is defining where do we want to go? Where are the disease areas and targets where we're most effective that we could really help the most patients? And so we looked at 100, over 100 disease areas and we really got deep in them understood the pathophysiology, the, the underlying cause of disease, the, you know, how, how we can modulate the target, the assays, everything. Uh, in many of the cases, we realized, well, we need uh, a gene therapy 2.0, to, to use the terms that have been going around, or we need to innovate a new technology. We need a capsid that can get to certain cells. We need a promoter that's conditionally active, or this high, or this low, or whatever it may be. So, we have clarity where we want to be. We have clarity on what we need to get there. And so 
that makes it easier for us to go out and scan the world and find out who's really excellent at it. And so that's the first part. The second part is uh, finding a partner that not only complements us and that synergizes with what we do well and what they do well, but have the people in the awareness of what a relationship might, you know, the people that can communicate in the awareness of what a partnership could look like. So what I mean by that is there are benefits and drawbacks of working with a small company, just as we're a small company working with a big company, there are some pros and cons, right? And so being aware of that and being able to work with that partner around those issues is critical. And so one, you brought this up earlier, um, and I just want to mention it now, one of the things we've done is we have tried to bring in people, especially from the alliance management perspective and BD, um, who've seen it both sides. They've worked for the really big companies, they work for the small companies, and they have that shared experience and we can, we can get through things. Um, so I think to sum that all up, it's you know, knowing what we want, what we can't do ourselves, uh, finding synergies with the right people who are good people, or the right companies that are good companies and um, they have the willingness to, to endure with us. Great, thank you. So Adam, can you, you talked a lot about you know, um, Gene Therapy 1.0, Gene Therapy 2.0 and, and 3.0, which I, which I really like, and the importance of partnerships. So can you maybe elaborate on that? And how do you, you, you know, you have so many partnerships you know, when I was looking at your slide, I thought, you know, what, what's the process Novartis used to, to maintain those partnerships in a, in a healthy and vibrant way? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So I, I think kind of similar to Josh's comments about how you go about finding these mm -hmm. in the first place, um, you know, from a Novartis perspective, we sort of know what we're good at, right? We have these core disease areas of expertise um, from scientists to clinical development to, to, to sales forces, et cetera. Um, already built out um, and in place. And so we have expert expertise in these areas. Um, so first is kind of going around to each of the core areas that we're good at developing drugs in and figuring out um, what are the major unmet needs still that uh, gene therapy in particular could, address, could be used to address in, a, in a, again, a transformative way. Um, and, and once we sort of have those core sets of objectives defined, on a DA by DA kind of basis, um, then then there's the really the fun part, right? Which is we go out and boil the ocean, um, and you know we look for value and valuable assets, technologies, collaborations, etc. Anywhere we can find it, and we follow the science, frankly. Um, and you know, so so I spend a lot of my time in academia. Actually, um, I think that this space is. Um, particularly well suited uh, for academic investigators initiating these ideas. I think it probably has something to do with the fact that you know they're able to bypass traditional drug optimization steps, right? That you'd otherwise have to go through with small molecule or protein therapeutics. Really, at the end of the day, we're talking about printing out sequ sequences and putting them in known delivery modality. So, I think that the bar or activation energy for investigators getting into the space and doing really cool science is, is lower in that regard. Um, and so, um, and so we, we, go, we go there a lot um, to try to form, you know, really good strategic partnerships around, you know, high risk, high reward, potential opportunities. Um, and I think from a BD perspective, the way we kind of maintain, to your point, um, is we contemplate what the best trajectory of development is for any given program or asset or technology. And then we craft a deal around that that trajectory, because really that's the most important thing in the end, right, is the ability for these drugs to move forward as seamlessly as possible by marrying expertise between the parties. Um, and so one of the nice things about, about you know, being in BD and Novartis is that we aren't, you know, uh, limited by deal structures. Um, and so, you know, we do everything from academic collaborations to acquisitions of companies. Um, so it really just depends on a case-by-case -case, um, basis the route will follow, but we want to do best by the asset ultimately for patients. So, um, so hopefully that gives some insight as, as to the, the process from an early stage perspective. Great, thank you. So, um, you know, I, I don't think I disclosed this prior to heading up commercial development. I did head up our BDNL team in 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 R and D. So, it, it's kind of good to to hear you know, the excitement still with, with people. I think people, you, you know, BD 
has a bit of a glamour kind of to it, but I, I think people don't realise there's a lot of less ga glamorous tasks in BD as well, right? <laughs> um, but, but thank you. So now we have about just, just over 10 minutes or so to answer any questions from the audience. So anyone have any questions of, of me or the panel that we have up here? Would you like to grab the, the box? <laughs> kind of changed in quick order and manufacturing has come a long way, but one's been consistent is, is the conversations with the payers. So I'm kind of wondering as Spark gets folded into to Roche or um, Avexis into uh, Novartis, how does the conversation change or does it at all with the payers with the, the mothership taking control at that point. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can maybe just address that real quickly. I, I think there hasn't been, um, from, from what I've seen, very much change because, um, you know, again, uh, going back to the point raised earlier, Spark remains an independent subsidiary of Roche. And, um, you know, all of, all of Spark's functions, um, you know, as, as an integrated gene therapy organization are still supporting Spark's gene therapies. And, um, you know, in, in such a specialized area, some of the conversations with payers, for example, some of the, some of the contracting models that Spark has in place um, are, are very unique to, to gene therapy specifically. And um, so having that expertise or uh, having that background of, of or that relationship with a payer uh, to be able to discuss those things, I think, is, is super key. Yeah. Adam, do you want to comment on that as well? Not my area of expertise. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I'll just make one, one comment from, from CSL's perspective. I think, you, you know, one of the, it's so new, gene therapy, and the, the models are not really evolved enough to, to deal with them generally. So each case is so different. And, and we've found as we've been going around talking to, to payers, you, you know, they're on a steep learning curve uh, as well. And, you, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be really interesting, I think, over the next two, three, four years as more therapies uh, come into the space. You, you know, so I'm, I'm not sure that, you know, the bigger companies have that much more expertise to, to Lawrence's point because no one really has the expertise in, in gene therapy and how we truly can, can match the value that, that they bring with the, the willingness uh, to pay. And it, it, it's going to be interesting, I think, to see, to see how this uh, evolves. Um, one thing I would say in, in our experience so far, the payers are certainly willing to get around the table and learn and talk about how we can make these therapies get to the patient. So they, they've got the, the desire. I think they just don't all have necessarily the tools that they need. Um, and, and contracting is probably the only, it's the only tool we've got at the moment is contracting. And, and that's tough. I mean, you've got to support those. You, you know, it's easy to say, well, we'll pay for performance. But what does that really mean? I, it's a really interesting area um, that I think will evolve. Any other questions? Yes. So as you can tell, I, I, I don't look like Chinese, so I'm going to ask a question about China. Uh, so uh, as gene therapy moving forward, and China has enormous demand, but a completely different playbook, I just, I'm just wondering, what do you think about the strategic partnership and your China collaboration strategy? And this question is for all of you. Well, who wants to go first? I mean, I would just um, make a brief comment. It's probably not going to address your entire question. Um, <laughs> but just from a search perspective, one of the things I've noticed or observed over the last couple of years is that um, there, is a, there is increasing visibility, rapidly increasing visibility to gene therapy in China. Yep. Um, you know, we're coming across companies, investigators all the time that are making very good progress um, on bringing therapies forward. Um, I think playing it forward, you know, whatever it ends up being, five, 10 years, 
um, into the marketplace there remains to be seen for sure. Um, and it's just something that we'll have to kind of craft with time. Um, but I am very happy to see all of the uh, exciting progress that's been made um, in that particular territory just because of the number of patients you could potentially reach, right, um, in, in most of these cases. Um, and so it's an area that's been certainly on our radar. Um, I don't know that there is an answer to the, you know, the commercialization model. Um, I'd be interested to hear you guys' perspectives, but. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't think there has really been, uh, uh, you know, any change to our, our model either. Coming from a Spark perspective, I think, um, you know, the strategy to, to, to really be able to reach every patient globally is still in place. And Spark, um, you know, has, has really been trying to leverage the global capabilities of the, of the larger organizations to do that. So in the case of Luxterna, um, you know, with, with Novartis and then other assets with, with the Roche Group. Um, so, um, you know, really the strategy is there globally. Yeah, yeah look, and I, I can comment from, from C cell bearings perspective and particularly just in haemophilia, which is our, our focus. Um, so we have a large organization uh, in China. We only sell one product, but it's one of our biggest products uh, globally. Um, so China's actually a very, very strategically important country for us. And we, we you know, and it actually, will be coming out soon, but, but, but we intend to have our entire portfolio of products in China at some point, and we're particularly, as soon as we get through this um, intense phase of, of working with Unicure on the submissions for, for FDA and, and EMA, we'll then put our minds, and we've already started to explore how could we take Tranides uh, to China. So I think we've got a lot of learning still to do. The haemophilia... Um, community in China has not been well served um, and you, you know they don't even have some of the what well, you, you know the products that are available in in the rest of the world but they're very keen to say well we don't want to have to wait and go through all of those and then we finally get gene therapy so I think there's the opportunity to kind of leapfrog uh, in in China and we we, we, we will definitely uh, be looking at how we can do that. My, my Chinese uh, colleagues, particularly the GM, he kind of rang me the day after we announced the deal and he said, can I get it? Can I get it? So, so there's certainly the appetite. There's not yet the pathway though. So, so I think we're going to have to create that a bit. Um, but I know in haemophilia, I just read a couple of weeks ago, a small company to, to Adam's point, are starting a gene therapy trial in haemophilia. And, and so I think the innovation in China is, is going it, to... It'll, it'll, it, China will catch up because they've got the ability to, to have that striking level of innovation. and It's going to be exciting, I think. All right, any, any, any other questions? Good. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for joining me today. Thanks for sharing your insights. Hopefully uh, it was helpful to people to learn about, you know, different ways of partnering and, and some of the benefits and some of the learnings along the way. And we, we can now all get six minutes and uh, ten seconds by the time I uh, finish talking back in our day. So thanks again, everybody. Thank you.